Thank you, Madam Moderator. It works. And uh, thank you, host, Professor Maloney, and uh, fellow members of the panel. I listen with utmost interest to, um, to your introductions. And it really is an honor for me to be here. And, and also, the, the timing that just a few days ago, three leaders of three Christian churches together advised governments how to act. Um, the timing is wonderful. And that indeed is, you said it, a sort of a dialogue. And please allow me a few observations as a civil servant. And I, you introduced me as a special envoy on religion and belief, and that's what I am. But it might be for most of you quite a puzzle, what does such a guy do? Well, in the past week, I was involved in um, positioning ourselves in the Human Rights Council. I lead an, um, an alliance for international religious freedom and belief, and we um, decided on a statement on the situation in Afghanistan from the perspective of, of religious minorities. Um, I visited a mosque of the Ahmadiyya community in the Netherlands to discuss with them their plight in the uh, UMA. And we had a training in our ministry on how we, as Western Dutch people, act in the Middle East, how we interact with Islam. And I can tell you that was quite an exercise. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to discuss a few elements of dialogue, and the first one is between governments and religions. For governments of secular states, with a constitutional segregation between state and religion, religious dialogue could be approached from a utilitarian perspective. What brings it, especially for our objectives? But that should not be. Alberto Maloney is quoted as having said in a recent webinar hosted by Berkeley, either government or religion by itself can only simulate and pretend to engage in dialogue while asking for something. Government typically sees religion as useful because it can be called on for low-cost services, especially in the humanitarian sphere. Why fight religion, you apparently said, why fight religion when you can buy their help for a few pennies? And on the religious side, leaders want to become more visible and to use the government to do that. Especially when things are going wrong in governments, they have more to talk about." Unquote. Again, a wrong approach from both sides. When governments recognize religious and faith communities as part and parcel of civil society, they can indeed profit from the capacities of these communities and their members. And we as Dutch have learned so over centuries. For many years, religious communities cared for the fabric of society, and although I have to acknowledge that with secularization, this wonderful network of caritas has become weaker, it's still alive in many respects, as it is in several other European countries. But such division of labor is not without risks. First and foremost, there is the risk of favoritism, a partisan approach the one religion favored over the other. And I fear you all know examples of that. But I should also refer to accountability on funding and respect for all and every human rights. FOB, freedom of religion or belief, does not free religious people and entities from basic respects. Then there is the dialogue between religions. As a young boy, born and raised in a Protestant family, I lived in a deeply segregated society. It was Christian in majority, but divided over many denominations. We all lived peaceful, not together, but next to each other. We called it a pillarist, pillarized society. These days one calls it siloism, silos with pacification only at the top of the pillars, where the leaders regularly concluded on issues of general interest. Parliament was made up of several Christian parties, plus liberals, socialists, and a few others. 
Some of you might recognize their own country in this picture of my past. Since then, society secularized and new religions like Islam and Hinduism grew, thanks to immigration and natural growth. New divides needed to be bridged, and thanks to our way of dealing with issues in the past, the religious communities, old and new, can still, amongst themselves and vis-à-vis -vis the government, deal with general issues. And they do it together. Like in the past months regarding COVID and the issue of not or yes, having religious services. We boast several initiatives where people with different religions and beliefs work together for society, both local and national. So even after secularization, we still have a strong civil society, not as religious as before, but still social. And as positive effects, the appreciation between the religions has grown. They don't take their position in society for granted anymore and have learned to confront themselves with new challenges. Since a number of years, on the third Tuesday of September, when the new budget is presented by the King, a wide variety of religions and faith groups together stage a special interreligious service to start the new parliamentary year, attended by the Prime Minister, members of government, diplomats and other dignitaries. And they truly do it together. So even in a secular state, there can be mutual recognition, tolerance and cooperation. But the combination of secularization, which also means diminishing lack of understanding what it means to be religious, and our traditional way of dealing with issues, makes it difficult for us, the Dutch, to understand why elsewhere in other countries there is still so much and often such a deep division between religions and also within religions. We have learned that the old Cold War concept of peaceful coexistence may have been effective and efficient in Cold War days, but since 1989, the internet and the proliferation of social media with all its negative and positive connotations force us to adapt to, re to respect diversity, to think and act inclusive, and work together on improving our global open society, respecting universal human rights for everyone and everywhere. We all are entitled to the same human rights and are confronted with the same challenges and have committed to the same sustainable development goals. In the first decennium of this century, and even more so in the aftermath of the growth of jihadism, governments like the Dutch became more aware of a changing environment, and we needed to adapt. Firstly, we needed to understand what it means to be religious. So a learning, a relearning of what we lost, what it means to be religious. That's why we have those trainings. And second, we start promoting a cooperation civic engagement of and between faith-based organizations explicitly as part of a civic society. We just started a new program with the promising title Joint Initiative on Strategic Religious Action, JISR A. And this program is characterized by being multi-religious and thematically intersectional, addressing several rights and issues, some of them being sensitive from traditional perspectives. And against this backdrop, I am very pleased that you succeeded in presenting a series of recommendations to the D20 leaders. And more regularly, I'm impressed by initiatives, for example, in the framework of alliances like Religions for Peace. And all those individual initiatives what we, that we noticed in COVID times and are weekly documented in the Berkeley highlights Although I also have to note that they also document examples of setback and pushback, negative forces from religious leaders. The dialogue within the religious. When we talk about inter-religious dialogue, we must also address intra-religious dialogue. 
the example of my youth taught me how important that is. Still too often, I witness exclusion in the name of truth. And thanks for your words on the value of truth. Whereas love should be the driving factor of any religion or belief. All men are fallible and make mistakes. Strong views later prove to be weak. New and unacceptable insights for now turn out to be mainstream after a number of years. Let us learn from each other and open to each other. And thank you for the explanation of the meaning of dialogue from that perspective. For governments, the intra-religious quarreling is difficult to appreciate and handle. Even with deep division between and within religions, all concerned are citizens of that nation state and are entitled to the same impartial governance of that same government. Leaders are actors. Dialogue is so often between leaders. And thanks again, another quote, Alberto. Interreligious dialogue since the 90s, you apparently said, has been re-traveling the first mile over and over. True, you apparently said, it is important, but it's easy. We all agree that there should be no legitimization of violence. Then we end with kisses and candles in front of the camera. And apparently that it was. Now we have to walk the second and third mile, apparently. I could not agree more. Today is a day to act, and therefore I again welcome your initiative for recommendations to D20 leaders. But never forget the actors that you represent as faith leaders. And please respect individual human rights, also of those who never subscribed or no longer subscribe to how you see the truth. And lastly, please do not let dialogue turn into a suffocating process, killing individual freedoms and views. Thank you very much.